Shabbat Shalom to everybody. I see Priscilla is saying Shabbat Shalom. Praise Yahweh for the connection. I see Francois also joined us online. So good to be connected with our covenant family again. And for this morning's recordings, you can already get it on YouTube. So it was a nice upload, quick and fast. And so we're carrying on today looking at 2 Samuel 6, verse 1 to 7, verse 17. Ricardo, I think it's going to read. Okay. Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David rose up and went with all the people who were with him from Baalei Yehuda to bring up from there the ark of Elohim, that is called by the name, the name of Yahweh, the name Yahweh of hosts, who dwells between the Kerubim. And they placed the ark of Elohim on a new wagon and brought it from the house of Avinadav, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Achio, sons of Avinadav, were leading the new wagon. And they brought it from the house of Avinadav, which was on the hill, with the ark of Elohim. And Achio was walking before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were dancing before Yahweh, with all instruments of fir wood, and with lyres, and with harps, and tambourines, and with cisterns, and with cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nahon, Uzzah reached out <coughs> toward the ark of Elohim, and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the, red of El and the red of Yahweh burned against Uzzah, and Elohim struck him there for the fall, and he died there by the ark of Elohim. And David was displeased because Yahweh had broken out against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah until this day. And David was afraid of Yahweh on that day, and said, How shall the ark of Yahweh come to me? And David would not move the ark of Yahweh with him into the city of David, but David turned it aside to the house of Obed Edom the Gittite. And the ark of Yahweh remained in the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite, three new moons, and Yahweh blessed Obed Edom and all his house. And it was reported to Sovereign David, saying, Yahweh has blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that he has because of the ark of Elohim. David then went and brought, a, brought up the ark of Elohim from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And it came to be when those bearing the ark of Yahweh had gone six steps that he slaughtered bulls and fatted sheep. And David danced before Yahweh with all his might, and David was wearing a linen shoulder garment. Thus David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of Yahweh with shouting and with the voice of a shofar. And it came to be, when the ark of Yahweh came into the city of David, that Michal, daughter of Shaul, looked through a window and saw Sovereign David leaping and dancing before <coughs> Yahweh, and she des despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of Yahweh in, and set it in its, in its place in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. And David brought a sending offering before Yahweh and peace offerings. Now when David had finished bringing a sending <coughs> offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of Yahweh of hosts. And he appointed to all the people, to all the crowd of Israel, from man even to woman, to each one loaf of bread, one loaf of bread, and a measure, and a cake of raisins. And all the people left, each one to his house. And David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Shaul, came out to meet David and said, How esteemed was the sovereign of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the, of the female servants of his servants, as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michal, Before Yahweh, who chose me instead of your father and all his house, commanded me to be a ruler over the people of Yahweh, over Israel. So I danced before Yahweh, and I shall be even more slight in this, and shall be humble in my own eyes. But as for the female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I am esteemed. And Michal the daughter of Shu'u had no children to the day of her death. And it came to be when the sovereign was dwelling in his house, and Yahweh had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the sovereign said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I am dwelling in the house of Cedar, but the ark of Elohim dwells within curtains. And Nathan said to the sovereign, Go do all that is in your heart, for Yahweh is with you. And it came to be that night that the word of Yahweh came to Nathan, saying, Go and say to my servant David, Thus said Yahweh, Would you build a, build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Mithraim, even to this day but have moved about in a tent and in a dwelling place. Wherever I have walked with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a, a word to anyone from the tribe of Israel, whom I commanded 
to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? And I will say to my servant David, Thus said Yahweh of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the flock, to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great ones who are on the earth. And I shall appoint a place for my people Israel, and shall plant them, and they shall dwell in a place of their own, and no longer be afraid. Neither shall the children of wickedness oppress them again, as at the first. Even from the day I commanded rulers over my people Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. And Yahweh has declared to you that he would make your house. When your days are filled and you rest with your fathers, I shall raise up your seed after you, who comes from your inward parts, and shall establish his reign. He does build a house for my name, and I shall establish the throne of his reign forever. I am to be his father, and he is my son. If he does perversely, I shall reprove him with the rod of men, and with the blows of the sons of men. But my loving commitment does not turn aside from him, as I turned it aside from Shaul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your reign are to be steadfast forever before you. Your throne is established forever. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. See, Alex is also saying Shabbat Shalom, family. Glad to be able to rest with you in worship today. Carol's saying Shabbat Shalom. So, all glad to see that uh, we have a covenant family that just waits for us to be on mine together. So, it's nice to be in the presence of set apart ones. Yeah, and online. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going with the flow from this week of right worship versus wrong worship. Set apartness and the pursuit thereof and making Yahweh set apart versus Yahweh not being set apart and the esteem not being brought to him and compromise setting in and what results because of that. So in Devarim 10 verse 8, we are told at that time Yahweh separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, to stand before Yahweh, to serve him and to bless in his name to this day. <coughs> So Yahweh separated the tribe of Levi as the tribe that would bear the Ark of Yahweh. And there was clear instructions. We've, I mean, we've just been through Shemot a couple of weeks ago, all the design of the tabernacle, what was brought, what was made. And as we know, the Ark of the Covenant had rings uh, um, that were made on the side of the Ark, gold rings overlaid with gold, and poles were put through the rings by which to lift the Ark. So this was for the, the sons of uh, Kehath, they would be the ones that would uh, bear the ark and carry the ark on their shoulders once everything was wrapped up, etc. And so when we come to this Torah portion and this passage that we've just read here, then we understand the valuable lesson that um, when David gathered all the chosen men, 30,000, to go and fetch the ark, and then this incident with Uzzah happened, we, we need to just get a bit more details or hopefully highlight what was some of the events that kind of led up to this event that we're reading about here? Um, and many years before, when I mean many, many years before, because, you know, Israel were camped at Eben Ha'ezer, or Ebenezer, as some would like to say, and they were in battle against the Philistines, and that day 4,000 people were, were, um, were, died in battle of Israel. So... Israel were in a bit of a panic, and they thought, what's going on now? 4,000 men have died. The elders cried out, and they sent for the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh to be brought um, from Shiloh, where it was, seat, where it was uh, positioned, so that Yahweh would be in their midst and save them from the Philistines. When the Philistines, when the, when the Ark of the Covenant came into the camp of Israel, there was great shouting, there was celebration. The Philistines heard this celebration, and they got a bit worried, and they said, listen, the shout of a sovereign is in their midst. And then they encouraged one another and said, don't worry, let's go to fight against them, you know. On that day, 30,000 of Israel's men died in battle, even with the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh in their midst. Okay. The Ark of Yahweh was captured. The Philistines took the Ark of Yahweh, took it into their territory. And on that same day, Hophni and Pinchas, the two sons of Eli that were wicked priests, died on the battlefield. And on that same day, Eli also died. 
When news of the ark being captured was brought to Ely, he was an old man on his rocking chair. He rocked backwards. He was a big man, heavy set, fell off the chair, broke his neck, and he died. Then <clears throat> one of his daughter-in-laws, the, the, the wife of one of the sons of Ely, um, when she heard that her husband was dead and the ark was captured, she was pregnant. She gave a, a premature birth. And as she was giving, uh, uh, she went into labor, gave birth, and she called her child Ichavot, and then she died. You know, now Ichavot means no esteem, because the esteem of Yahweh had departed from Yisrael. And this is a clear lesson when we spoke earlier about everyone who comes, tell the whole camp of Yisrael that everyone who comes to him, he, he must be esteemed. You know, because where was the esteem being given to Yahweh? Israel were mixing their worship, then going out and trying to fight against the enemy. And Yahweh is saying, I'm not fighting for you because you're not esteeming me. You're not setting me apart. My ark is going to mean nothing to you when you're not serving me the way I command you to serve. And that's what happened that day. Because in those days, Hophni and Pinchas, they were corrupt priests. They were taking women at the door and, uh, you know, and... and, and Doing false worship, they were corrupting and, and, and extracting uh, um, different payments from people and things like that. So a real corrupt priesthood, and Yahweh dealt with them, you know. And so Eli didn't discipline his children when Yahweh told him, look what your children are, look what your sons are doing, they're profaning worship. And so the Philistines then took this ark. And now Israel, they'd been shouting with great praise, thinking the ark of Yahweh is here. And how many people today think, you know, Elohim's with us. And you can make whatever fashion or shape or form that you think Elohim's with you, but you haven't been serving him. You can shout and cry as much as you want. He's not there. You know? And so when the Philistines took the Ark of Yahweh, I mean, that was a devastating event in Israel's eyes. I mean, it was an eye-opening thing. So they, they went and took it into their territory of Ashdod. They set it next to their mighty one called Dagon. Dagon was the fish deity, you know. And in their temple of Dagon, they set up the Ark of Yahweh. Now, this Dagon was depicted in their religion in fashion and shape by idols as half man, half fish. So he was the fish deity, the fish man, you know. And so when they came the next day to their temple to see Dagon, they saw, hold on, Dagon's fallen over. So they put him up again, you know, what happened here? And they come the next day, he's not only fallen over, but his hands and his head were cut off, you know. So now they got freaked out. The Philistines were like, what's going on here? So um, this was an interesting thing because the, the place of Ashdod, where Dagon's temple was, is called, uh, Ashdod means powerful. And the Philistines were in fear, and they saw this place where they worshipped their mighty one, Dagon, which means fish, in their assumed place of powerful worship. And their powerful worship was now being destroyed by this Ark of the Covenant that they had captured from the Israelites, you know. And so Yahweh began to strike the Philistine camp with tumors and all kinds of cancerous tumors and things. They decided to get the Ark of Yahweh away and they sent it to another Philistine camp. They thought, okay, let's get it away. The same thing happened there. Another outbreak of tumors. Now you must understand, the Philistines are like freaked out here. What's going on? You know, why isn't Dagon saving us? You know? And so then the Ark of Yahweh went from uh, Ashdod, it then went to Ekron, it went to another Philistine city and then um, it went to Gaza or Uz uh, um, Azar. And so wherever the Ark of Yahweh went, Yahweh sent destruction on the Philistines. And after seven months being in Philistine territory and facing much devastation, they decided to send it back to the Israelites. Now, Ashdod, Ekron, and Azza, or Ashkelon, three, or a number of these cities, they're all on the, like the coastal side of the territory of um, Israel, okay, and and we see these cities or some of these cities being ma named um, as a shadow picture of the destruction that would come on the Philistines, being prophesied through Tzephaniah, when Yahweh's destruction will come on the enemies of his people. In Tzephaniah 2 verse 3 to 4 it says, Seek Yahweh, all you meek ones of the earth, who have done his right ruling. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. 
If so be that you are hidden in the day of wrath of Yahweh, for Azar is abandoned, Ashkelon laid waste, Ashdod driven out at noonday, and Ekron is uprooted. So these were all Philistine cities, and what Yahweh was basically saying is this is it. The wrath of Yahweh is coming to destroy, to uproot, to lay waste, to uh, um, abandon, because his presence isn't anywhere there, and he's going to completely destroy them. So being gripped with fear because of the ark of Yahweh bringing destruction upon them, they, they put the ark of Yahweh on a newly built ox, or a newly built ox cart, and they took two mother cows that had never been hitched or yoked with any kind of yoke to lead them or guide. They simply were. Hey? It's not a bull. It's a mother cow. Okay, it's a it's a cow. Okay, so not a bull. Okay, and anyway, these cows that uh, had just given birth to calves, never been used to pull any wagons or anything like that, it took their calves away from them, hitched them to this cart and sent them on the way. And they said, listen, if these cows go on the way to Beit Shemesh, Israelite territory, then they know they've done the right thing. If they go off the way, then they know Yahweh's brought all these plagues. If these cows that have never been yoked, they don't know, they've never driven anything anywhere, if they go off on the field and they scold, and then we know this isn't Yahweh, we can bring it back. And so here these mother cows, mother cows, are you? <laughs> They're exactly right because they did have kids. Yes. Babies. So they were mothers. Yeah, yes. they were mothers. Calves. Calves. <laughs> Getting all our, all our descriptions right here. So here these two mother cows. <laughs> off they go on the road and they stick to the road bellowing as they went. Woo, woo, woo. I don't know how cows bellow, but, you know, moo, 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 moo. <laughs> Praising Yahweh in cow language, and they go off on the road, and they don't deviate from the path, and they go straight to Beit Shemesh. You know, when the Israelites saw the ark of Yahweh coming, when the men of Beit Shemesh uh, um, saw it, they began rejoicing, and they were in the field of Yehoshua. And they celebrated with offerings. They, they obviously broke up the cart to use as a bit of few, uh, f uh, wood for the fire. And they offered up these two mother cows to Yahweh as ascending offerings and celebrated. And so the place of Beit Shemesh means house of the sun or sun temple. And it's interesting to take note because as we consider what happened here, at this point when they were celebrating... There were some who were foolish and looked inside the ark and they died. In fact, 70 men died that day. A unique number. Because this is a picture of how we cannot worship Yahweh according to the way that the world's system of sun worship dictates. As they presume to be able to look upon the presence of Yahweh, yet do so at their own peril as they do so in a manner that's not prescribed. Mm. Coming to approach Yahweh any which way they want. And think that they can just treat him as, hey, you're one of us now, thank you. You know? 70 being killed that day, we're able to see a representation of how the, the world system of sun worship practices will be destroyed. 70 representing the number of the nations. You know? And so many may presume to know Yahweh and his presence, but we will be rejected and destroyed, as we've mentioned many times. They then sent for the people of Kiriath Yearim, and to take the ark and put it in the house of Avinadav, which was just a few kilometers away from Yerushalayim. So now it was getting closer to Yehuda territory, but get it away from here, from your, the field of Yehoshua. Remember, Yehoshua was part of Ephraim, or you're from the tribe of Ephraim. Kalev was from Yehuda. Now the ark of Yahweh remained in Kiriath Yearim for 60 years. So while all this was going on with the Philistines, David was not yet sovereign. But then when it came back to Beit Shemesh and then went to Kiriath Yearim, while it was at Kiriath Yearim, King Shaul was made king during the time it was there. Okay, But King Shaul was never interested in bringing the ark. All the years of his reign, he was never interested in bringing back the ark to Yerushalayim. Years later, this is where we come to our story with David. David is now king. King Shaul's gone. He's dead. David's now been set up as sovereign, and he seeks to bring the Ark of Yahweh back to Yerushalayim. So it's been 60 years since it was there. And we know in our own generation, and over the last dec or a few decades, 
how quickly things can change or how quickly people forget how to do things. So 60 years prior, you had 70 men being killed for looking in the ark when thinking they're celebrating the return of Yahweh because it's not done according to the instructions. Mm -hmm. David presumes, now let's go and get this ark back because we need Yahweh's presence with us because he, Yahweh's called David, set him up as sovereign to lead his people. Now he wants Yahweh's presence. Sets up a tent for it. Let's go and get the ark of Yahweh. And so as great as his intentions were, they were a bit disastrous at first. You know, so he neglected to follow Yahweh's instructions regarding the transportation of the ark. Maybe there were stories of how it was brought back from the Philistines that were handed down to the next generation, etc. So what do they do? They build a new wagon. I mean, even if it was, they burnt up the wagon that the Philistines sent, but even if it was still around, a 60-year-old vehicle would not be the ideal vehicle if you were supposed to use a vehicle. You know, so... They get this idea, let's build a wagon. Mm. And as they go, you've got Uzzah and Achio, the brothers of, that were sons in the house of Avinadav. So they've been brought up in this house with the Ark of Yahweh there. They certainly would have understood what the presence of Yahweh meant. Because we don't have record of their house being struck with tumors. You know? And so we understand that Avinadav would have certainly taught his sons the ways of Yahweh. So now they come and they start, they put it on a wagon, which they made in the first mistake that they did. And so everything about the Ark of Yahweh is a means to communicate about the character of Yahweh. And when you don't treat it the way Yahweh, when they didn't treat it the way Yahweh instructed, mm -hmm. you are not giving esteem to Yahweh and you're not setting him apart as he desires to be set apart in our, in our eyes. And so the, the, uh, the presence of the Ark of Yahweh was a illustration of his absolute set-apartness. And this demanded that he be seen as set-apart by those who were supposed to handle his presence. And so they didn't, you know. And so it's in the little details that people get wrong, that Yahweh says, that's not the way I want you to do it. Because if you get the little details wrong, you'll eventually throw off the whole need to obey you know, and so Yahweh has not changed, like Melinda was reminding us earlier. You know, people need to hear Yahweh did not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He calls for total disobedience. Yeah. We are his dwelling place. We are to bear his presence the way he commands. And therefore, when we are to lift up his presence, we are to lift it up properly. That's why Shaul says he desires men everywhere lift up hands that are set apart. Because it's not that you walk around with hands in the air because you'd look silly, you know, and then you'd never do any work. And your shoulders would get sore. You know? <laughs> the, but it's about your works unto Yahweh that it's always unto him in complete set-apartness. Mm. And so when we look at these events, we see how compromise disrespects the word of Yahweh. Compromise is defined in, in the English dictionary as a settlement of differences by mutual concession. Now, while the world loves to promote this as a standard because let's all get on. It's not a scriptural standard. A settlement of differences by mutual concession. It sounds nice, but that's something that Yahweh never wants us to do. When it comes to his word, his will, and his ways. His word is the final authority on all matters. He's not there to come to a mutual concession with us. He's not there to negotiate new standards, you know, on differences we have in regards to understanding his word. He demands total obedience. Now, as we know from history, Israel made many compromises and it got them into a lot of trouble and it caused a lot of deaths. They paid dearly for it, you know, and I think we can often relate in our own lives how if we've ever compromised in any way Yahweh's standards, it always has negative effects and outcomes, not just on our own lives, but on others too, you know. In this account, Israelites made at least two compromises in regarding to the handling of Yahweh's ark. And at first glance, it might seem to be harmless. And, you know, to some might think this was a bit harsh, this treatment and this punishment. But they, they, they had a failure to transport it to, um, correctly. What is told in Bamitbar 14 verse 15, or 4 verse 15, which we'll get to in a few weeks, 
It says, when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the set-apart objects and all the furnishings of the set-apart place at the breaking of camp, then the sons of Kehath shall come to lift them up, but let them not touch that which is set apart lest they die. These matters are the burden of the sons of Kehath in the tent of meeting. So they didn't transport it correctly. Number one, it should never have been on a, on a wagon. And, and secondly, they, they, there was failure to heed the no touch clause. That's as simple as it is, you know. It was made abundantly clear that the set apart object was not to be touched. And in this account, the Levites followed the example of the Philistines. They placed the ark on the wagon. And so as they were going, they think everything's fine. And, you know, it hits a bump in the road. It's like as if Yahweh can't protect his own ark, you know. Uzzah jumps out. He tries to catch this ark, thinking he's doing a noble deed. He's doing something good. And he gets struck down for it. David's angry. He's not angry necessarily at Yahweh, but he's, in the flesh he's kind of angry because he had this expectation of the presence of Yahweh after 60 years returning. And look what's happened. So they then set it aside in the house of Oved Edom, and it was there for three months. And David went back, probably thinking, what am I going to do now? But when David did go back, and after three months hearing that Yahweh blessed the house of Oved Edom, he then said, now we've got to go back. But he instructed the Levites this time, you bear the ark of Yahweh on your shoulders. You do it the way the Torah instructs. And as they brought it back, every six steps they stopped and slaughtered and praised Yahweh. It's a picture for us of six days you work, the seventh, you come together and you rest from your, your walk in the week and you come in together and you slaughter offering of praise to Yahweh as a collective. You know, And so they bring this ark in. And he's in a linen shoulder garment. And this in itself is a prophetic shadow picture for us of the goodness of our master who came in the flesh. Because David's wife, who saw him dancing with the crowds, oh, look at you making yourself so degraded amongst these plebs, you know? <laughs> she was so snooty and royal that she couldn't look and be amongst the people kind of thing. And how dare you take off your royal... He was not naked, by the way. By her saying, why you become naked like this, he took off his kingly robes and he was wearing a linen shoulder garment. Okay? So these were priestly garments. So this is a shadow picture. Now we know David was from Yehuda. He was not from Levi. And so we know our master and king is from the tribe of Yehuda, but he is high priest and king forever, of which the shadow picture of the Levitical priesthood is about as high priest and and king that we serve. So David is a, a shadow picture example of Messiah coming in the flesh, humbling himself, taking the form of a servant, and bring the presence of Yahweh back to his people that had be, where his esteem had left because of disobedience. So Yeshua Messiah, our high priest and king, has provided the way back for us to have his presence. And this is a rejoicing thing that we, we see being kind of pictured here, you know. And so this shouting, the Hebrew word that's used in verse 15, thus David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of Yahweh with shouting and with the voice of a shofar. The Hebrew word for shouting is teruah. And then if we think we're almost, we're, we're close to Yom Teruah, you know, remember the shouting. We're told on Yom Teruah to have a remembrance of trumpets, a remembrance of shouting, because what the remembrance is, is the remembrance that we are a bride that's been redeemed. We are betrothed. Our husband is coming. His presence is coming for us. You know? And so we, we, we have this great rejoicing heart that seeks to have Yahweh's presence fully met with us. And the people are rejoicing. And when, when David finished bringing the ascending offerings and peace offerings, it says in verse 18, he blessed the people in the name of Yahweh of hosts. Just as we read in Vayikra 9 this morning, that after Aharon did all the offerings, he stood up, raised his hands, and he blessed the people. Blessing for obedience. And then he appointed all. They all got a cake of raisins and, you know, and, and a loaf of bread. This is a clear picture of the fullness of the provision. You know, a cake of raisins, it's not, 
It's not a raisin cake, okay, in, a, in the sense of a baked cake with raisins inside it. It's not, a, it's not one of those. It's not a fruit cake, okay. It is when you hear a cake of raisins or a cake of dates or a cake of soap, which you don't need soap, but you understand the concept, or a cake of figs. It's something that's pressed together. So these raisins were all pressed together into what is called a cake of raisins, and each person got their supply. Now, getting raisins and getting bread, again, is a, a shadow picture of the master. He is the vine. He is the bread of life. So in the rejoicing of his presence coming back, the sufficient provision for all. He's given us all that we need for life and reverence. We, as branches, can now be grafted back into the vine and have sustenance from the bread of heaven as we meditate on his Torah day and night. And we can take that provision with us and be sustained by it. You know, And that's when his wife saw, it says here in, um, in verse 20, David returned to bless his household, and Michal, daughter of Shaul, came out to meet David and said, how esteemed was the sovereign of Israel today? You know, you can imagine the... Oh, look at you, you know. And the, the Hebrew word here for, for sovereign is melech, which is king or sovereign. And he answers, he says, you're acting so foolishly. She was trying to say, you're the king of this people. And look at you, you're acting like a fool. David said to Michal, before Yahweh, who chose me instead of your father, listen, it, you know, I'm the one that, Yahweh chose, not your father. The people chose your father. Yahweh chose me. Mm. And all his house. He commanded me to be ruler over his house, over the people of Israel. So I danced before Yahweh. Notice here the Hebrew word for ruler is nagid, which means to be leader, ruler, or prince. So she says to him, you are sovereign. You shouldn't be with these people. He said, Yahweh, who Yahweh is sovereign of hosts, he is the king, appointed me to be a prince. Mm -hmm. And so I danced before him. And so here, David didn't say, oh, yes, I know I'm king. He didn't see himself. He was appointed king, but he knew Yahweh's king. Because when the people asked for Shaul to be king, Shemuel is upset, said, Yahweh is your king. Why do you seek him? And Yahweh said, let them take him. And so here we see a very powerful picture of humility of David, surrendering under the authority of only one true king and saying, yes, he's appointed me to lead and to be a prince because it's part of a royal priesthood and a royal setup. And he says, you know what, I'll even be more slight than this. In other words, I am not ashamed of the good news. Mm -hmm. And Shaul says, you know, we're not ashamed of the good news. We make our boast in Yahweh. That's what David was doing here. And that's how we should be with the presence of Yahweh in our lives. We shouldn't let people speak down to us and then we think, oh, I can't show my love and my, my passion and zeal for Yahweh because somebody's going to criticize me. You're going to get criticized. You're going to get persecuted. But you know what? Show your love for Yahweh even more. Amen? And then comes the uh, uh, promise as he was dwelling in his house. So there's a bit of time that goes on. Part of the curse, actually, because remember, children are a blessing for obedience. And part of the curse for Michal is that she never had children to the day of her death. So she would never produce any fruit of the womb. You know? Oh, sorry, I thought we were going to say something. And so and a little while later, we're not, we're not given an exact time frame, but it's a little bit after the ark has been there in the tent that David set up for it. What I also like here is that now David wants a house for Yahweh, you know. And so he saw that he's given him rest. All the enemies are, you know, Yahweh's not plaguing Israel. He's, he, his presence is there, but no men are dying. So there's peace with, the, you know, all around. There's nobody coming to fight against them. And so he says, you know what, I'm dwelling in this wonderful house, but the ark of Yahweh is dwelling in curtains, in the tent that I set up, you know. And so Nathan said, do everything that's in your heart. And so Yahweh then speaks to Nathan and says, go tell David, he's not going to build me a house, his son is going to build me a house. Mm. You know, and, he, and in verse 14 of chapter 7, it's a clear statement. I am to be his father, he is my son. If he does perversely, listen to this, this is again, I shall reprove him with the rod of men 
and with the rod of with the blows of the sons of men. And as we we're reading, that struck me again today. It's like Yahweh disciplines us and he uses people and he uses the rod, the authority of people to discipline you. That's why Shaul says, subject yourself to all institutions, because it's of Elohim. You know? But my loving commitment does not turn aside from him as it turned aside from Shaul, which I removed from before <coughs> you. And your house and your reign are to be steadfast forever and ever. Your throne is established forever. This was a, a this is this this event that, or this these words that Yahweh gave to David is an establishment of an everlasting covenant. Because he promised to Abraham that that's a covenant he doesn't break, but now by David he was establishing the throne of that covenant being set in place forever. For his beloved, you know. And so here we see a, a very powerful picture that. You know, Yahweh saying, Shaul are destroyed, but your son I'm going to discipline when he's naughty. <laughs> kind of thing. And when he doesn't listen to me. And as we look at this Torah portion here and this, these events here, there's such a wonderful lesson in learning how we are to carry Yahweh's presence, how we are not to carry his presence, and how we are to be about building ourselves up in the most set-apart faith, encouraging one another, all the more as we see Yahweh's day coming near. Because, as we read earlier, when I read from Ezra, speaking about when the foundation was laid, the people celebrated and rejoiced, they gave a great ringing cry. Our Master and our Rock, our Elohim, He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. He is the rock upon which we stand and which we're being built up in. That's established forever. His throne is established forever. Therefore, we can rely on the authority of his word forever. And know that the authority of his word is the word that we must allow to discipline us and reprove us when we need to be disciplined and reproved, and need to be encouraged, need to be corrected, need to be trained. And this is something that we get to celebrate and not be afraid to do so in the face of those who will persecute you for doing so. Bearing Yahweh's presence His way is a clear call that's being made through this chapter. Compromise deflects the blessing of Yahweh. That's very clear, you know. And David would not make the same mistake twice. That's one thing we can learn through David's life of the record that we have. You know, he made some terrible mistakes and choices, but he never made them again. And I was just thinking about that because uh, my eye just caught the bit where it says Yahweh killed Shaul because of the trespass of keep not doing what Shemuel said he must do. Yes. Because he saw, he misrepresented Yahweh in the eyes of the people. Yeah. David never did that. No. He sinned against his fellow man. Yes. But he didn't misrepresent Yahweh yeah. ever. And he didn't presume to take Yahweh as, oh, he accepts what I do. Where Shaul is a picture of the flesh and pride, David is a I'm the king. I'm, yeah. yeah, David as here, I'm the I'm a prince. I'm not the king. Mm -hmm. David is a picture of humility and servanthood towards a fellow man, and every and sometimes he, he messed up. Mm -hmm. But when he did mess up, boy, you've got record of David crying out to Yahweh to not take his spirit from him. You know, David experienced in his day the return of the presence of Yahweh because the history of it. Remember, when the esteem of Yahweh had departed, David was not yet born. You must understand. Because the ark stayed in Kiriath Ye'arim for 60 years. And when David brought the ark back, he, came, he, was, he became king at 30 years old. So I want you to do the maths. So when David was born, the ark of Yahweh was in Kiriath Ye'arim. Okay? It, it was not brought back by King Shaul. He'd heard, he would have heard of how the ark had ended up taking a journey through Philistine and ended up in Kiriath Ya'arim. But yet, the heart of David was always to get the presence of Yahweh back. And that's why he was called a man after the heart of Yahweh. Because that was in his heart always, is to have Yahweh's presence. And we need to emulate that heart as a beloved of our master. You know? 
And so by him bringing back the presence of Yahweh, he cries out when he made mistakes saying, please do not take your spirit from me. Don't let your presence leave me. David understood what it would be to be without Yahweh and didn't ever want to live without him. And that's, that's when we're going back to that question, how set apart is Yahweh to you? Because if he's not set apart, you may just compromise and compromise deflects the blessing of Yahweh because you show no esteem to him, you know. Yeah, with Shaul, it even says twice, because he didn't inquire of Yahweh. Yeah. He went to the Shemuel, dead Shemuel, and he went to, you know, the, yes. the witch. But he didn't inquire of Yahweh. He never sought, because the ark of Yahweh represented his presence, and Shaul wasn't interested whatsoever. Mm. The first thing David really does as an act of his being put back in position of, uh, or being put in position of sovereign, was to set up a tent for the ark of Yahweh. As soon as that's prepared, let's get the ark back. His urgency to get the presence, and he misguided his, he had a bit of a misguided zeal by not fully understanding the requirements. And I think we all can fall into that category at times where we, we almost feel like we're overzealous for a moment, but we, before we've read through the rules kind of thing. But we must never lose that zeal and that celebration of Yahweh's presence in our lives. We have so much to celebrate. We have so much to, to rejoice in. And we either can fall into the compromise of joining in with the grumblings of this world, or we celebrate Yahweh's presence in our lives who gives us shalom. Because he promises in, in, in his word that even our enemies will be at peace with us. And that's what we see here, pictured here. In the beginning of chapter 7, you know. Do all that's in your heart. Yahweh is with you. What a confirmation that the prophet had. I mean, now David desired, and Yahweh said, what you say in your heart is a good thing, but you're a man of blood. Your son's going to do it. I mean, it's... So it, David never lost the heart to still prepare and do what's required. We don't know if we'll all be alive by the time our master comes, you know. Some of us may not be. May, we might all be. But whether we think we know or don't know should not stop our zeal to make the right preparations for our master's return. With a heart that's burning to just keep praising him completely and having the set-apart garments, the linen garments of righteousness clothed upon us completely in humility and service to, who, to one another and to Yahweh first and then to one another you know anybody want to share their thoughts on this passage it's always a wonderful passage to to be reminded of how we are carrying Yahweh's presence and Uza means strength you know and it teaches us a valuable lesson Yahweh is our strength you know, don't try and think that you can do things in your own strength, because that's the lesson from Uzzah. Okay, let's go read. Where are we? Mark 7, Marcos 7. Who'd like to read? Okay. And the Pharisees and some of the scribes assembled to him, having come from Jerusalem, and seeing some of his taught ones eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Yehudim do not eat unless they wash their hands thoroughly holding fast the tradition of the elders. And coming from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions which they have received and hold fast, the washing of cups and utensils and copper vessels and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your taught ones not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And he answering said to them, well did Yeshayahu prophesy concerning you hypocrites, 
as it has been written, This people respect me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me, teaching as teachings the commands of men. Forsaking the command of Elohim, you hold fast the tradition of men. And he said to them, Well do you set aside the command of Elohim in order to guard your tradition? For Moshe said, Respect your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is korban, that is, a gift, you no longer let him do any matter at all for his father or his mother, nullifying the word of Elohim through your tradition, which you have handed down, and many such traditions you do. And calling the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is no matter that enters a man from outside which is able to defile him, but it is what comes out of him that defiles the man. Mm. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he went from the crowd into a house, he stood once asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, Why are you also without understanding? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside is unable to defile him? Because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purging all the foods. And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil reasonings, adulteries, whorings, murders, thefts, greedy desires, wickednesses, deceit, indecency, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these wicked matters come from within and defile a man. Okay, so not sure if we want to, if we need to speak much more about this. We spoke before lunch about this, but one of the things I can add to this, um, we know that it was about the dispute over washing of hands before yes, eating yeah. bread or any kind of meal. Um, what he was saying in, in rebuking these hypocrites in forsaking the commands of Elohim, he says, you've got traditions. One of them is example, he's, he named one. He said, for instance, the command says, respect your father and your mother. And we spoke about that as a as also through Shalom's parables of Proverbs about giving weight to the Torah as that which instructs and disciplines us. And he says, but you say, he who, uh, um, and, and it also says, he who curses father or mother, let him put, be put to death. So to curse a father or mother is the opposite of respecting or giving weight to. In other words, the Hebrew word for curse, kelala, also means to make light of. So that's why it's not taking weight, not taking serious. You take lightly, you give no respect. Okay? But he's saying, that's what the word says. But now what you say is, you know, whatever profit you might have received from me is korban. That is a gift. Now, korban is also understood as that which causes you to draw near. So, and it's something set apart. So what they did is they didn't want to take care and respect and look after their, their mothers and fathers as a picture again, showing that they have no respect for Yahweh and his word. So now what they'd do is they'd, they'd come with this hypocritical show and say, what I am supposed to try and help you with, now I can't because that's actually, it's a gift, it's set apart, you know. And he says, you, you, um, you no longer let him do any matter or for his mother, mother or, or his father or his mother, nullifying the word of Elohim through your tradition, which you've handed down, and you've got others that you do. So a lot of people today like to use the word as an excuse not to do um, the proper respect that is shown to father, father and mother and to one another. I mean, this is just one of many of the traditions that they had. But meanwhile, their so-called korban was not to Yahweh. They're just using that as a, as a way out, a loophole in their understanding or presentation of the truth to get out of their responsibility that the word clearly prescribes, you know. And Messiah made it very clear that what comes out of a man, that's what defiles a man, not what is put in. Yeah, but I mean, that verse, is, the way he says it's not what enters a man that defiles him, it's a little misleading. Yes, but, that, but no, it's, it's misleading not, today. Yeah, if you just read it, then yes. you think um, nothing that you eat defiles you. But I mean, he's talking yes. about eating Food. dirt. Yes. <laughs> dirt so is, you know. at the time, I mean, today, many want to see this and say, well, what you put in, it doesn't defile you. So they see you can eat anything. But what he was saying is a little bit of dirt on your hand when you're eating from the fields is not going to make you unclean. It's not going to defile you. It wasn't about 
other foods, which we've discussed already. And at the time, there wasn't people there saying, oh, does that mean we can eat pork? No. That's a Hellenization of this chapter that's presented by the hall, you know. Meditate on the Torah day and night. Let it be in your heart. Because the Torah is not worthless. It's in our hearts and in our mouths to do it. But when you're not meditating on the Torah day and night, it's not going to be in your heart. Then your heart's going to be far from Yahweh. And we just spoke about David being a man after the heart of Yahweh, which means he pursued righteousness. You know? Walk by the Spirit, not according to the flesh. That's basically what this chapter is highlighting for us. And then the wonderful chapter that's also misinterpreted too much, Acts 10. Who'd like to read Acts 10? On Kepha's wonderful journey to the nations. Now there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a captain of what was called the Itali Italian Regiment, dedicated and fearing Elohim with all his household, doing many kind deeds to the people and praying to Elohim always. He clearly saw in a vision, about the ninth hour of the day, a messenger of Elohim coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. And looking intently at him and becoming afraid, he said, What is it, master? And he said to him, your prayers and your kind deeds have come up for a remembrance before Elohim. And now send men to Yafo, and send for Shimon, who is also called Kepha. He is staying with Shimon, a leather tanner, whose house is by the sea. And when the messenger who spoke to him went away, Cornelius called two of his household servants, and a dedicated soldier from among those who waited on him continually. And having explained to them all, he sent them to Yafo. And on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Kepha went up on the housetop to pray, about the sixth hour. And he became hungry and wished to eat. But while they were preparing, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heaven opened and a certain vessel like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth, in which were all kinds of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts and creeping creatures and the birds of the heaven. And a voice came to him, Rise up, Kepha, slay and eat. But Kepha said, Not at all, master, because I have never eaten whatever is common or unclean. And a voice came to him again the second time, What Elohim has cleansed you do not consider common. And this took place three times, and the vessel was taken back to the heaven. And while Kepha was doubting within himself about what the vision might mean, Look, the men who had been sent from Cornelius having asked for the house of Shimon, stood at the gate, and calling out, they inquired whether Shimon, also known as Kepha, was staying there. And as Kepha was thinking about the, the vision, the spirit said to him, See, three men seek you, but rise up, go down and go with them, not doubting at all, for I have sent them. So Kepha went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius, and said, Look, I am the one you seek, why have you come? And they said, Cornelius the captain, a righteous man and one who fears Elohim, and well spoken of by the entire nation of the Yehudim, was instructed by a set-apart messenger to send for you to his house, and to hear words from you. So inviting them in, he housed them, and on the next day Kepha went away with them, and some brothers from Yafo went with him. And the following day they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius was waiting for them, having called together his relatives and close friends. And it came to be that when Kepha entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and bowed before him. But Kepha raised him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And talking with him, he went in and found many who had come together. And he said to them, You know that a Yehudi man is not allowed to associate with, or go to one of another race. But Elohim has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. That is why I came without hesitation when I was sent for. So I asked, Why have you sent for me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, 
And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and see, a man stood before me in shining garments, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your kind deeds were remembered before Elohim. Now send to Yafu and call Shimon here, who is also called Kepha. He is staying in the house of Shimon, a leather tanner by the sea. When he comes, he shall speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. And now we are all present before Elohim, to hear all that you have been commanded by Elohim. And opening his mouth, Kepha said, Truly I see that Elohim shows no partiality, but in every nation he who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. He sent the word to the children of Israel, bringing the good news, Peace through Yeshua Messiah, he is master of all. You know what word came to be throughout all Yehuda, beginning from Galil after the immersion which Yohanan proclaimed. How Elohim did anoint Yeshua of Nazareth with the set apart spirit and with power, who went about doing good and doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for Elohim was with him. And we are witnesses of all he did, both in the country of the Yehudim and in Jerusalem, whom they even killed by hanging on a timber. Elohim raised up this one on the third day and let him be seen, not to all the people, but to witnesses, those having been chosen before by Elohim to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to proclaim to the people and to witness that it is he who was appointed by Elohim to be judge of the living and the dead. To this one all the prophets bear witness, that through his name everyone believing in him does receive forgiveness of sins. While Kepha was still speaking these words, the set-apart spirits fell upon all those hearing the word. And those of the circumcision who, who believed were astonished, as many as came with Kepha, because the gift of the set-apart spirit had been poured out on the nations also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and extolling Elohim. Then Kepha answered, Is anyone able to forbid water, that these should not be immersed who have received the set-apart spirit, even as also we? And he commanded them to be immersed in the name of Yeshua Messiah. Then they asked him to remain a few days. Mm. Okay, I'm sure we're all very familiar with this chapter, but it really is one that we, are, we should be well equipped in, especially in the days where we are calling people out of the corruption of whoring, because this is typically one of the chapters that people misunderstand, or parts of the chapter anyway, and try and use it as a license to say, well, Yahweh told Kefir to eat, you know, anything he wanted to eat. And as we mentioned before lunch earlier that... Uh, this was obviously Yahweh coming to meet Kepha where he was at in terms of his physical state. And being at a time when he's hungry, he challenges Kepha. Now three times also we see this picture and this play. We get, there's so many threads and, and, and wonderful pictures we can see in this whole revelation of how the word of Yahweh, even as Kaleen was reading towards the end of that, how he appointed Israel to be a light to the nation. You know, so here we've got that... The way we, you know, the three times also thinks about the three times a year that men would go to keep the seven feasts of Yahweh. Because the blanket with all the animals also represents a feast type thing. Go and eat. But the, it wasn't about animals. It was about going and getting the people that from the nations that need to be made clean. You know? And so while Kepha is thinking there, Oh, what's this vision about? And then he says, there's three men. So three times this thing came, three men at the door. What's going on, you know? Kepha, maybe, maybe we're a little bit like Kepha. When you start hearing three or seven or 50, you kind of, what, there has to be something here, you know? And, and so he, he lets them in. They stay the night. They must have had wonderful discussions that night. Remember, you've got to understand Kepha's history and how Shaul often had some uh, hefty words with Kepha too because Kepha, you know, he would go to people, but when the others were around, he didn't want to be seen to be associated with, with those of the nations. And so we see this was a huge challenge that Yahweh had to work in Kepha's heart as well and reveal to him that this is what the good news is for. And so they would have spoken quite a lot that night. Then he goes and he says, comes to the house of Cornelius, a well-respected man, feared you know, one who was Elohim fearing, he prayed to, to Elohim often. It would, I mean, he didn't understand the fullness of the spirit and the things of Yeshua Messiah, but he was one that was after the heart of Elohim seeking. 
you know. So now Kepha goes and it says here, while Kepha was doubting within himself about what the vision might mean, you know, then the men had come from the house and he was thinking about the vision and the spirit said, three men are here to seek you. Mm. He says, but rise up, go down with them, not doubting at all. In other words, he was told, Kepha, stop doubting this vision. Because mm. Kepha might have been thinking from a fleshly point of view. There's absolutely no way Yahweh would tell me to eat what is unclean. Mm. And he would have been wrestling with that. And rightly so. But it wasn't about the food. He said, go with these men and stop doubting the, the, the vision. Why? Because it will become clear to you. Because in verse 28, it says, and he said to them, this is Kepha speaking. He says, you know that a Yuri man is not allowed to associate with or go to one of another race. I mean, this was their traditions. You don't let a Yehudi go and associate. I mean, it was, it was not done. But now he's nullifying all the rubbish laws that, and traditions that they'd put in place of separation. He says, Elohim has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. You know what he was saying? The Yehudi were calling you guys unclean. Men. And Yahweh's shown me that I should call no man unclean. Which means all Mankind has the ability to sit at the master's table and eat, but we have to go and gather them. And we should not call anyone unclean if they are seeking Yahweh, you know. What that means is there are people that are unclean. I mean, even the leper had to cover his lip and say, unclean, unclean, so to warn you, you know, don't go close to the guy. You know, so there are people that we know, that we can see by their lives that they're not clean and we can call. What this means is that you don't say, oh, there's no hope for him. He can't be part of this when, when they are earnestly seeking Yahweh. Because there are groups today, whether it's British Israel or whether it's black only Israel. And I'm using this and I'm be serious here. This is where we have to stop the nonsense. Because there are today on the Torah walk, different factions which say only the us and not you. All who call upon the name of Yahweh can be delivered. Now, calling on his name is about obeying his word. There is, it doesn't matter your background, your ethnicity. Mm. You know, it's about a heart after Yahweh. And that's what he's addressing here. We should never discard somebody because of where they come from or what they look like or their status in society, whether it's high, low, or indifferent. We're warned about that as well in the book of James when a guy comes in and he's got all these fancy clothes on and you say, come sit here. And the guy in rags, you say, no, 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 you just wait. Wait and see. Let's see if there's a seat. You just kind of, no. You don't show, par what this is, you show no partiality. That's what it's coming down to. And then down in, in verse 34, and then opening his mouth, Kepha said, truly I see that Elohim shows no partiality. But in every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. You see, you can't have true fear for Elohim if you're not working righteousness. Because, you know, the fear of Elohim is the beginning of wisdom. And as we said earlier, wisdom is advantageous to make one kosher. You know. And so we see this is the clear picture. He sent the word to the children of Israel, bringing the good news through Yeshua Messiah, he's master of all. So again, it's an establishment of what Israel didn't want to be a light to the nations, and that's what Yahweh rebuked them for. I called you to be a light to the nations. Now he's reminding Kepha, in Messiah Yeshua, the good news, he is master of all. Now get out there and tell people that. And he starts sharing Yeshua Messiah. He starts sharing the good news and then the spirit falls on these people and he can see they're prophesying and they're speaking uplifting words and he could see this is by the spirit of Elohim. They're speaking things that they should not know in a sense, you know. Look at them. They are the zeal in that. And that's when he says here, and those of the circumcision, obviously the Yehudi, they were astonished by saying, oh, the gift of the set-apart spirits on them too, like it is on us. Suddenly, it's not just Kepha, but those that were with him are suddenly see seeing that, yes, we're not the only ones that can have Yahweh, <laughs> you know. And Kepha says he commanded them to be immersed in the name of Yeshua Messiah. Okay, so they had the spirit. That wasn't it. You still need to have Messiah's immersion, you know. 
Because that would then make them one together in unity. Because it's no longer Roman or Greek or Jew. It's one in Messiah. You know, so this chapter has got nothing to do with the food laws. Yahweh used the image of unclean and clean beasts to get into Kepha's mind and heart, which was at first a stumbling block to him, to see that he needs to be a light to the nations too. And that those who fear Elohim and God righteousness are accepted by him. Anybody want to share their thoughts on this? Or what we've been reading today? And I think the clear thread for me today is about having that renewal of mind day and night, knowing that we are to learn to separate the unclean from the clean and the set apart from the profane. It's of critical importance. And that comes down to every aspect of our lives, even down to what we eat, and more importantly, what we eat, because it's a product of how we live. You know? Those that are online, I know I mentioned a couple of things, what we said before lunch, so I encourage you to go and look on YouTube at the, the recording from earlier, because then it will tie in with a lot of things that we've, we've discussed now after lunch. But if anybody online would like to share anything, you're welcome to do so. I see Carol also saying Shabbat Shalom. There's a few viewers on here with us. So we'll give a moment or two if anybody would like to send encouragement or share any thoughts. Anybody here? No questions or yes, Patrick? Uh, well, I've got the definition here of Yahweh. I just want to see if it's correct. The definition of Yahweh? Yeah. It's... it's I got it out of one of, you, one of the stuff you okay, said. I don't think I called it the definition, but read. No. Uh, well, I was trying to give it a name. Okay. What it means, Yahweh. It says, Behold, the outstretched arm of all the existing one shall come and secure his covenant and redeem us in order to establish his house for which he is coming again. Mm. Now, what I've been doing this last couple of weeks I've been taking the name of Yahweh to, 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 to people because I found thousands of people. I haven't been to all thousands. But <laughs> I was going to say, that's quite a lot this week. Huh? <laughs> but they, they, they don't know the name of Yahweh. Yes, no. and, and I was concerned about that. So I thought what I would do is, is take this name to the people and see how they react. And most of them didn't believe this name. But then when I, when I, when I got this... this uh, this paper I, I, I took out of one of you, the stuff you sent, mm. when he says, Behold, the outstretched arm of the all-existing one shall come and secure his covenant and redeem us in order to establish his house for which he is coming again. Mm. Now, now that means that I took the name to the nations. In other words, this name in my mind was the good news mm. I was taking to people. So is that, is that yep. fine? Yes. <laughs> well, look, when we take the name, I just want to read to you, when you're talking like that, we read it a, a couple of weeks ago. I'm not sure how long ago. Yeah. It wasn't too long ago. Romans 10. Yeah. When in verse 12 uh, to 17 says, Because there is no distinction between Yehudi and Greek, for the same master of all is rich to all those calling upon him. Mm. For everyone who calls upon the name of Yahweh shall be saved. Quoting from Yoel, which is speaking about the day of Yahweh. Yeah. So all who call upon the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. But the calling isn't just a verbal, vocal call. That's not what it is. It's not an inciting of the name. Mm. Okay? It's part of it. But then it goes, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Mm. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without one proclaiming? Mm. So yes, we are to go and proclaim his name to the nations. And how shall they proclaim if they are not sent? As it has been written, how pleasant are the feet of those who bring the good news of peace, who bring the good news of the good. However, not all obeyed the good news, for Yeshiyahu says, Yahweh who has believed our report. So then belief comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Elohim. So here's what I'm telling you today. It's one thing to say, oh, here's the name of Yahweh, and this is what I understand it means. It's the all-existing one, behold, coming to secure a covenant, and he's coming for his house again. You don't, that's, that's part of it. 
You need to bring the good news. And the good news is that he came in the flesh. This one that walked here and died is our saviour and rose again. This is what Kepha went and he started sharing the good news with Cornelius and his household. And so in sharing that, so it's one thing to say, here's the name of Yahweh, you need the name, but then you need to expand on that, the good news, because going and sharing the good news, but you've also got to realize many are not going to believe. That's what we're also told here. But we don't take, okay, because some will not believe, then we think, oh, well, I'm not going to go. How are they ever going to know or have the choice to believe or not if they're not told? How are they going to be told if no one's going to tell them? And, and how is anybody going to tell them if nobody's bringing the fullness of the good news? So I was just going to say that fullness bit. Because yes. Cornelius was uh, fearing Elohim, doing kind deeds, yes. believing. Yes. But Yahweh sent Kepha to him to say, it says here, mm. um, and who shall speak to you words by which you shall be saved? Yes. So he, it's like, no, so, he wasn't. Saved he wasn't him. saved yet. <laughs> but I mean, if it's like you need the whole, you, you need the good news too. Yes. Because he says, uh, this bit where he says, in every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is accepted yes. by him. Yeah. It's yeah. the full package. It's not. And that's where it, it says in Chazon that this is, you know, those who bear the witness of Yeshua and God the commands. Yeah. Mm. So it really is. So here you have, as Cornelius is a, a wonderful picture for us of the Elohim fearing. And they're doing good deeds, mm -hmm. but they're not saved yet. Yes. And it takes those that have the truth to go with words of deliverance and salvation to them, the good news. Reveal to them who this Savior is yes, yeah. Yeah. that you are starts, fearing. Yeah, starts, with, yeah. starts with the revelation of his name. Yeah. Starts with the revelation of his name and then what's attached with the character of his name. We spoke about, is he set apart to you? Because that's part of the thing. So you go, we've always said, Israel coming out of Mitzrayim, it was the revelation of the name mm -hmm. and the Sabbath as two key door openers. Yes. And then the Sabbath, the expansion of that good news becomes more and more. So too, we don't just take a name. This is the name, you should know the name. And you think, okay, I know, because a lot of people are carrying on with their futile ways and think, okay, I know the name and, they, and they're using the name. Mm -hmm. They're calling, yeah, they're calling on Yahweh in the Christian church and it's an abomination to him because they worship him in lips only. Their hearts are far from him. So we need to encourage people what needs to be in the heart. You know, so it's a good, it's, it's how we start. But like we're saying, it's, it then opens up the door to bring the fullness of the good news. And then they will either kick you out or they'll want to know more, <laughs> you know. One of the things that we've got, we've, we need to do, because when Kepha went and spoke to him, he said, these are words of the good news. You, whenever you hear something good news, people think they're going to get their ears tickled. It might not necessarily be so. The good news is, call back to obedience. So the good news is, he came to give us a way that we can live and not die. And this is the way, obey and fear and esteem and set apart Yahweh. Yeah, and I mean, it says as soon as he basically came back from there, the circumcised took him on for going. Yeah. Mm. I also want to ask, like, Pat, um, is this okay if I say that? Yes, yeah. Yo, Dave, you hold the Astro's arm with a cool yeah. hand. You hold the the tip, uh, the, the ten, 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 ten peg, yeah. Or, or the covenant. Or the nail. Yeah. Yeah. You hold the hand, yes. you hold the nail. Yeah. yeah. Yeshua, yes, Yahweh. that's the other. What for those that are online, you just reminded we're, we're Patrick's coming from the picture and Yan now coming from the picture of the pictograph of Yahweh's name with the Yod Hey Vav Hey, with the the Yod being the outstretched arm and hand, the Hey being the man with his hands raised and the Vav being a tent peg. Yeah. So here we've got a clear picture of the revealed who to whom is the hand of Yahweh being revealed. The Hey is behold or look what comes from or it's such an amazing sight. So it's the one who took the nail, who worked deliverance and took the nail, secured the covenant for us. So there are many ways that even in the ancient mindset would depict the working of Yahweh's deliverance because the two hays represent his two comings. So he came to reveal his outstretched arm to take the nail on our behalf to secure the covenant and he's coming again in the fullness and revelation of who he is as deliverer. So even in the, I mean... That's on the there. 
that, that little picture. Oh, there yes, we go. Yeah. There we go. You know, so, and, and this is a good conversation starter, mm. if you will, with people who want to know his name, in a sense. You know, so you're right, Jan, in saying that too. There isn't a script that that's what his name means. We're taking the pictographs, so I that's why I said I never said it's the definition of his name, but it certainly is an expansion of when you look at those pictographs, we're already seeing a description. Like with the Hebraic mindset, you can look at one picture and there's an expansion of what you can see in that. And when you collectively group pictures together, we understand why the words are pictured like that in the pictographic form, in the context of the text that it's written in. Mm. And so Yahweh is the same with his name. His name carries weight and meaning of describing that he is the one to come and save us. He is the one that works deliverance. Mm. And how awesome is that? That a creator would choose to stretch out his hand and take the form of creation to come mm. and actually save us. Why would you not want to know who his, what, what his name is? Mm. And that's what Proverbs says. You know, what is his name? What is the name of his son? You know, if you know it. Feed me my lawful bread. Give me neither riches nor poverty, lest I seize the name of my Elohim. You know, so, so it really is. So there's so much that we can take with the good news going out there and actually presenting this to the people that have good intentions, you know, or good deeds but yet aren't saved. And there's a lot of them out there. In, how many times you hear people say, oh, but they're good people. Cornelius was good people, but he needed to be saved. And now we knew he could use his people to reach the good people. <laughs> you know? So when we are truly his bride, there's a responsibility to go out and find the good people. <laughs> You know, with the good news. I'm talking of tent pegs, Sukkot's coming. Celebrate our boothing with Yahweh, so I hope we're all getting ready. We're a month and a week away or so, huh? Hey? No, just give the dates again. Okay. Yeah. While everybody's online, I'll do this now for you, so you all get your pen and papers out. Thinking caps, and I'll give you the dates for Sukkot. Okay, the I, I suspect, according to the calendar, that you see that this will be a 29 day month because on the evening of the at sunset on the 29th, uh, the moon illumination I think is around 1.3 or, or 1.4 percent. The next day, if it would be a 30-day month, it's over, it's close to 6%. So it's way too big to be a first new moon. So mm -hmm. we certainly expect sunset the 28th of August to be Yom Teruah, from sunset 28th of August to sunset 29th. So that's sunset of a first day to sunset second day. So when you need to put in any leave for work, you do that for the, twen month, uh, for the second day or Monday, the 29th of August, you, if you need to get off work. Okay, that will be Yom Teruah from a working point of view. Mm. Then uh, Yom Kippur on the 10th will be from sunset the 6th September to sunset 7th September. So that will be basically if you need to get out of, well, you do need to get out of work because you definitely don't work on Yom, Kipp Yom Kippur. Mm. Um, that's the fourth day, 7th September. And then Sukkot starts sunset 11th September and the eighth day ends at sunset 19th September. So we'll be leaving for Sukkot camp that first day morning, 11th September. There was the thought, should we go on the 6th? And, you know, whichever way it goes, there's going to be a rush to get ready, the either for day, no. the sixth day, the previous sixth day on the 9th of September. Um, that's a bit too fast after a Yom Kippur to have one day and then try and get going for camping, especially. With, so it's best that we, we've decided this year that it's best that we, we go to camp that morning, the 11th September. Um, and then we will come back from camp on the morning of the 20th September. Okay, so the first day of Sukkot is the second day, or uh, well, sunset 11th to sunset 12th. Eighth day is sunset. Um, where are we at? Sunset 18th to sunset 19th of September. 
So is everybody okay? Or, um, has everybody made mental we, notes? We're coming back on the... 20th. 20th, okay. Yeah. That, that, that's the day we'll be back up. Yeah. Okay. That was the 19th and Look, the part day. Yeah. People are... You, if you want to pack up after, after sunset on the 19th, you're welcome to do so, but... Uh, it's not going to... Okay, so everybody quite clear on the dates and, and you know and we do have some people that we know that are a month behind because they followed the 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 fault well i would say false i don't want to start getting false true but they followed various reportings of not being enough barley etc etc but it was very clear that our timing is correct we don't wait for the barley. We follow this, the lights in the, in the expanse, the mm. new moon closest to the equinox. Mm. The barley is a confirmation for us. We do see it. We do see not just the barley, but we see the, the, the birds migrating. We see the flowering of the almonds we, or the almonds budding. We see uh, there's, there's about between eight to ten various things in terms of nature that we can get. Mm. We very clearly see that the, the barley is always aviv after the equinox. It's a historical fact. And those that continued a month later, by the time Shavuot came, they would not have first fruits. It would already have fallen to the ground and been wasted before they could harvest. So mm. something to be able to encourage others, if they, if they come to that realization and they started the year wrong, there's no reason to get back in line and actually have Sukkot at the same time as us. You know, so mm. if you know of people like that and you, you you can encourage them in the right way and if they need further info and you need help, you're welcome to ask. You know, we'll guide people as they need to understand. You know, um, there are so many varying calendars out there and I'm thankful to Yahweh that we have 13 years now. This is our 13th year where we uh, have recorded pattern through the feast that we kept according to the lights mm. in the expanse that we can trust in Yahweh's clear description in Bereshit 114 he gave it in the sky for us to know his times and seasons so okay so everybody excited for Sukkot I hope mm. and so we're getting ready to to celebrate our master's presence so everybody has the dates so if you ask me again I'll give the dates again <laughs> <laughs> okay on that note I don't see any other comments here so I think we're done for today and praise Yahweh that we got to have our second session online with Covenant family. And so it's always good to keep encouraging each other, which I encourage you all to keep doing. So let's pray. Master Yahweh, we bless and praise your wondrous and mighty name. We thank you that it is you who gives us all that we need. And even as we sit here and thinking about your feasts and your appointed times, it is with great excitement. But let us carry the heart of David and have that desire and zeal to be more slight than this, to rejoice before your face, to not be afraid of the persecution and ridicule and comments and criticisms of others. But let us be ready to always give a reason for the hope that we have. In other words, our hope in you ought to be shining, that people should say, why do you have such joy in you? Master Yahweh, we pray that you would continue to equip us in your truth. Thank you that you continue to discipline us and correct us and train us and reprove us so that we can rightly divide your truth and set apart the, uh, um, and make a distinction between the set apart and the profane. Thank you that you continue to bless us a, as a family far and wide throughout uh, a couple of continents. And I pray you add to our number those who are being delivered and those that we are able to go and take your name and good news to. We thank you for your love and protection over us. May you cause us to be a people that keep our hands lifted in consistent praise before your face. We bless you and praise you in the name of Yahushua, our Messiah. Amen and amen. amen.